Take That and Roll podcast. Um, over the moon to have my first guest on me, uh, OG of Welsh MMA, Paul Hansestone Jenkins. Um, lots of people know Paul from the uh, from the MMA scene at the moment as the, the head coach of Dogs of War, uh, but Paul is is still, I believe, uh, the record holder for most professional fights for a Welsh fighter um, with regard to competitive bouts. So, you know, if I, you were the one person I wanted to to have to, to kick this series off. So, welcome, buddy. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, good as gold. Uh, same as everybody else. Uh, touch board. Yeah, I can um, imagine. Stuck in the house, but uh, we're getting on with it. Yeah, I can imagine it. It's um, it's, it's strange times, and I think it's, it's it's something that we'll we'll hopefully never have to put up with again. I'm hoping. Um, it's a one once in a lifetime situation. I think Jenkson is. So, oh, our age, our lifetime, we we could be dead in a week. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it could be once in a lifetime. You, you, and you, both, you and me are both definitely on the vulnerable list, don't we? Yeah. yeah? All right. Yeah. Um, let's have a look then. So, just to give people an introduction, then we. Where and when and how did you get into martial arts? What was your first introduction? First introduction was about 1975. Uh, I ended up um, at a judo club in Lanadin in Cardiff because it was in the days of Five and Drive. Uh, that was the next like, area over from us. My, do- my old man would go in the pub, have his five or six pints, it cost him, I don't know, a fiver. Uh, it jumped me in the judo club next door, and, uh, and that was me sorted for about three or four years. So, uh, so judo was your first start, yeah? Yeah, actually. Uh, that's, that's my bronze medal from the Welsh Clothes Judo in 1976 or 77. 77. Awesome. Uh, I think I think a lot of people will be shocked to think that judo was your first your, your first port of call in martial arts because obviously you've had um, <laughs> my grappling's off. Are you saying? No, 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 no. <laughs> but you know, your nickname says it all. Andrew Stone, you've got a reputation, yeah. and I, you know, I for one have known that you you're predominantly a stand up fighter. You've been involved in K1. You know, lots of your wins in MMA are through TKOs, KOs, and obviously your, your boxing background. But judo was your first introduction, yeah? Yeah, yeah, do, uh, judo for four years, I think. Uh, when, uh, so, how long did you train judo for? About three, three and a half, four years. Yeah, and was it then you, you, you moved on to the striking arts with your boxing and your kickboxing? No, because uh, and then I got in my mid-teens, found out what my cock was for, and then go near the gym for about five, six years. Because uh, <laughs> I had other priorities. Uh, All right, so, so, so what dragged you back into it? What dragged you back into it? Uh, Mick Alex Stevenson. Um... He's a medical rep now, so he's probably making a fortune. Um, he wanted to go to Taekwondo, as it happens. Maybe it started, so I, I ended up going along with him. Oh, what was that? About 80, about 88, 89. Um, so, yeah, I ended up with Taekwondo. Because it happened to be because I was working in Eastern Leisure Centre in Lanrami, Cardiff. Yeah. And one of the instructors was... Uh, Coaching out of there, so yeah, I ended up going to end up with taekwondo. Um, did all right. There's actually yeah. a stack of guys, especially in the UK with a uh, well, Mark Weir, ex UFC. Uh, yeah, yeah. Taekwondo background originally. Seeing, I think Lee Remedios uh, started with taekwondo of all things. Yeah, uh, that might be in Canada. Um, yeah. Uh, at the time, I think the the boom and bust of Kung Fu had gone. Yeah, that was the next cool thing at the time. I think it was Taekwondo yeah. for a bit. Yeah. So, so when did you start your MMA? What, what, you know, when did you think? Hang on, I'm going to give this a pop. And where did you see him? Where did you uh, first, you know, first have your first introduction to it? First introduction to it was through working at doors because I had the Welsh club in Cardiff for people back for almost twenty years. Um, first introduction was a friend of a friend. Was having drowned, was in the pub opposite. Went up behind a guy, lip, uh, Steve Ford, the guy, he's passed away now, but um, he was about 6'6, six, six, good amateur um, boxer. But he went up behind the guy, rear naked choke, had his feet off the floor, poor McKenna shit. 
five seconds, gone to sleep, you put him in the corner, and I was done and dusted. And I said, whoa. So I folded him around the ship, please, which is like a, um, a slot machine place around the corner. He yeah. said, what we just did? Where the hell are you learning that from? And I was up in Panath, it was. Um, didn't have any in the club. And I was around about 1990. I think 1999, 1990. Uh, so, yeah, that was the introduction to it. That was the introduction, yeah. So, on Sherdog, when I had a look earlier, your record, I've got it written down by you, is 41 wins, 47 losses, 8 draws and 2 no contests. And I'm, I'm guessing, Paul, is there's some fights have not been logged or recorded yeah, on that yeah. record as well. So, how, how many pro fights have you had at MMA? About 104, I think it is. But I, I'd rather stick a sure got dog. And I'm on about is this right? 98. I'm on. You're on. Hang on, you're on. 87, 88, 96. Yeah, 98 on sure dog. 98 competitive pro votes. I want two more. Because <laughs> <laughs> so someone's got to be someone's got to be first to do, do that hundred. Yeah. Um, It'd be so, fitting if it was you. I gotta be honest. How old do you know, Paul? How old do you know? I'm fifty in two weeks, which is gonna yeah. be bollocks because I'll be blowing my own cake downstairs. That's about it. <laughs> um, but but so, but yeah. also um, you you had a, a K1 boat recently as well, so you're still fit, you're still active and competitive. Yeah, yeah. training regular in the gym. So you'd fancy that last two fights to to hit that hundred mark? Yeah, round it off. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's a couple of old timers around who probably fancy it, and I know. Three promoters who want to put it on. Mm. But first, got to open the doors of that gym first. Yeah, you're right. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that, I'll be honest. Where, where was your first pro fight? I haven't got a clue. I'll have it now because i got a tablet for you. Here, for you. So, oh, let's have a look. First one. Trevor Cunningham. I remember Trevor Cunningham. He was one of Ross. Um, he used to fight on the grappling strikes at Ross Nicaragua shows, didn't he? Didn't he not? He was on Ross. He was on Ross Nicaragua, and he did. He knocked out Mark Way. Mark Way. I remember because he's a, he came, he's a judo background, isn't he? I remember that. And yeah, um, yeah. everyone was expecting Mark to come and start him, and, uh, and and he actually caught Mark with a clean shot, if I remember rightly. So that was your first yeah. pro fight. Was on that show, was it? Yeah, by look of it. But, um, on a grappling strike of it. Before that was all well, a couple of grappling strikes. Combat sports open trials. Um, that was the old Nick Noetta piece. I remember you on that scene with um, Alex Owens. And it, it's been, p- p- people slid me. Oh, Alex Owen. Yeah, I remember. I remember. The, the, the what's he called? Um, weight brackets were stupid. They only three yeah. weights. And he, I, he was at the bottom of our weight category. And I was the top weight. I think I, I drove right kick fuck out of his legs for like yeah. six minutes. About it. Yeah. I remember you started doing a bit of training together after that, if I remember rightly, didn't you? you was, um, yeah, yeah man, who's the other guy in Ollie Ellis. Ollie Ellis. Yeah. Wicked oh, fighter. Oh, oh. Got an amazing oh. record. But uh, didn't go anywhere. No, I, he was my first fight, Ollie, on, in the combat sports. Oh, that was my first ever fight. The same. We, um, uh, it was a draw because if it went uh, if it went the decision, didn't it? There was no decision. It was just yeah. an automatic yeah. draw. But um, no, no, in fairness, um, he he'd had a pro fight at that time as well. He, he, he dominated me, but I managed to hang on for the for the five minutes. He beat um, oh a, lo- a lot of good names, but he was good just, pro record. He was a good fighter. Yeah. Good fighter. He was he's just so beige. He was out the sell. He was yeah, annoying me. And, and he was wasn't he? Um, I think he was a full time fighter, my money. So yeah. yeah. I think it was, a, you know, back, you know, and, and this is something we'll touch on later. Back in those days, Paul, when me and you were first on, on, on the scene, there was no money. There was no, you know, it, it was oh, a yeah, pain money to get it, FC, you know, so. <laughs> um, couple of, one of the questions uh, that came up, somebody said about titles, because obviously you, you've won a few titles in MMA. So what, what titles have you won o- over the years? Well, over the years, my first one's that Julo one from 76. And then in the Taekwondo, I went Welsh squad, British squad, Welsh champion multiple times, going through the belt up the black belt, British champion, Welsh champion. Ooh, and then at one point I was boxing, kickboxing, taekwondo and Kyokushin karate. Um, I never, I, 
I love cooking machines. Probably the thing I did worse at of all things <laughs> that happens. Yeah. But um, I ended up being British squad with that. I won the Welsh amateur boxing title in '98 or '99. Uh, Welsh kickboxing champion, low kick and uh, shiny pants kickboxing British yeah. champion. I yeah. fought for. I got his name up in Glasgow. Um, Commonwealth title. Uh, the guy was on for 20 straight stoppages. Um, so he'd, he'd been around since forever. He put everybody away and I went a distance. <laughs> Which I took as a win because uh, he stopped his last 19. Uh, he was furious. Like he'd, he'd gone for 20 stoppages on a trot. But uh, oh, I didn't win a round. But uh, durable. Always been durable. What, what about MMA? What type was you won in MMA? Oh, a Cage Rage, uh, Ultimate Combat, um, oh, there was, Christ, it was with my head shot. At one point there were six worth having, I had four of them. Yeah, I remember, uh, remember, I remember picking up quite a few times. Did you, have, did you ever win the Cage Warriors belt? Nope. I no, fought for it twice. Yeah. Who did you fight? Uh, Adrian Dagorski. Yeah. He's one of John Cavanaugh's. Yeah. Um, and the other guy was cracking wrestler from north of England. Um, no, nah, he's gone blank on me. Oh, wow. um, uh, Abdul Mohammed. Ah, yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah. Okay. What, one, what, one of the um, one of the things I want to ask you because I, I and. For, for the newbies, you know, like I've been on the scene uh, a long time, so I remember when you was actively fighting Friday, Saturdays and Sundays on some weekends and you were somebody the promoters would 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 call on. And when, when I looked through your record earlier on, Shudo, there's some big, big names on that record that you fought, Paul. And I think there's probably a lot of people in the area don't realise the, the calibre of fight that you have fought. So in, in your mind, who's the most famous fighter that you've ever fought? Jeez, Not the best baby. famous. famous. Probably oh, Paul, either Paul Daly or um, Dan Hardy. Uh, I think there was something like I fought eleven people and beat them as well. Um, they actually went out to go fight in the UFC. Yeah. Um, it was just they were twenty-two up and comers. Uh, I was mid to late thirties. Uh, yeah. yeah, I missed. Just, just Ten missed. Ten years out. too old. Yeah, yeah, just missed that. You know, like you know, MMA in Wales. I was going through a purple patch, isn't it? And yeah. Yeah, you know, the likes of yourself and other boys from back in the day would give like the right arm to be around in this year or have this sort of um, opportunity the youngsters got today back, yeah, back yeah. in the uh, the late nineties, early two thousands. You know, um, James Doolan asked a question on Facebook, and it was, "Who has been your hardest fight?" Mm, that's a tough one, cause to find tough fight. Cause I was like Mark Weir, put me away in seventeen seconds. Um, mm. It is what it is. Uh, that's a tough fight. I lasted yeah. seventeen seconds, yeah. um, but I've gone five rounds, hammer and tongs, which were hard fights. So I've actually loved. Oh, Arnie Isaacson's probably one of my favourite fights. Yeah, because that was three rounds non-stop. Uh, up, down, up, down. Nobody held a good position for more than five seconds. Yeah. Was, I saw him the next day. And he beat me on points, he did. Uh, up in just outside Edinburgh, I think. Um, but I saw him in the airport the next day, and he looked like he'd been run over. And I didn't have a mark on me. I never really bruised or cut or anything. I'm going, how oh, did you win that? Because uh, <laughs> I put him on position. And uh, his coach, who's passed away now, sad circumstances. Carl Tanswell. Um, yeah, great bloke, Carl. Uh, a lot, lot of respect. Uh, sad loss to the community. What's that? He's a sad loss to the community, Carl. Oh, he's definitely, because yeah. he's the guy who taught me the hard way of the value of a good cornerman. Yeah. Because he wasn't a scream, he wasn't a shouter. Above all the background noise with Arnie, um, it was like fighting two people. Cause, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Every time I did something, Carl would go, Arnie, his left arm, have a look. And very calm, very broke. And I go, it's like fighting two people. And uh, he has such a wicked cornerman's brain. Um, I, was, I, was, I was half a beat behind the pole fight. 
just because yeah, yeah. top, top range corner man. So, so Arnie is who you would put as your, your hardest fight, yeah? My hardest fight, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, just touching on Carla, if I remember, not so long back before he passed away, didn't you go up and do um, a Padman course with, with Carla? Have I got that right? Did you go up and do that? Yeah, you did. Uh, it was amazing. Um, big eye opener because I'd gone, said, I said, uh, Welsh squad boxing. Yeah. I'd gone through all the yeah, amateur grassroots shit. Um, I thought I'd seen it all in terms of pad work, even with just the hands. And yeah. he had a completely different approach to it. And I was, um, it, it, it knocked off all the verbal cues. But be, uh, I'm still working. If I'm running a class, I'll run it on verbal cues. I'll go ones, twos, threes. Yeah, yeah, um, just keep a class running. But um, you can make you work at pace, subliminally, without using a, a word. It'll, it'll, it'll hold the pad a certain way. Um, yeah, yeah, and you react to it. And, uh, oh. Yeah, it was a massive loss because he was still just working through that process, still documenting it, and he was teaching it while he was learning it himself. Yeah. Um, but he, yeah, I'm still using a lot of what he taught me now. Yeah. Um, you know, Matt, Matt Inman's taking over up there now at um, SBG Manchester, and he's doing a great job. I mean, they've got uh, Jack Cartwright, you know, who's Cage Warriors world champion. they got some some real talented boys coming through there. So, yeah. you know, prop, props to, to Matt Inman for you know, t- taking up the mantle, you know, Carl would be proud of that, I think, because uh, Matt was probably one of Carl's, Carl's best students, you know, this came through. So, yeah, nice to touch on Carl. Um, moving on then, James Lake has asked, who would you have loved to have had a fight with? Uh, somebody that you never got the chance to. Who, who's, who's one person you would have loved to have had a fight with? MMA. Honestly, nobody, not one person. I never, I never got off. I was always chasing a good time, uh, in or out of the ring. So um, it was, who do you fancy? I fought in my era. I fought era. I fought nearly everybody. Yeah, you um, fought two. To be fair, there's, I don't think there's anyone on the list. You know that you didn't. Yeah, because I said, oh, people were, people were having ten fights, very well managed fights, ten, eleven wins. Boom, they're in the UFC. Yeah. Um, I did 17 in a year, one year, um, including five in five in April, five in a month. There were five Saturdays in, 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 in April. Um, and you fought every week? Fought, I fought every week, won every one of them as well. Um, cracking scraps. I mean, you know, 100, 100 plus pro fights, you know, but if we go on Sherlock, then 98. Yeah. But you, you were one of these guys, like, you know, you, you see today people talk about, um, and, and I think it's an unfair tag for yourself. Somebody would say, well, looking at his record, his mix, you know, could be dubbed as a journeyman. But you were one of them guys, as you've just said, that never shirked the challenge. You take a fight at 24 hours notice. And when Paul Jenkins arrived at the arena, you didn't know who was going to win, who was going to lose. You know, you weren't one of these no. guys that you see today where they turn up, they have a payday, they're competitive for two or three minutes, and then, you know, uh, uh, and then they're outclassed. You were one of them guys that I remember where you go, Do you know, Jenks could win this. It didn't matter who he's facing. I always remember thinking, oh, you know, when you're fighting Hardy or Daly, it'd be like, come on, Jenks, you can win this. Do you know what I mean? And um, I think that's testament to how tough you were at the time. And I think your record doesn't, doesn't reflect probably your capabilities sometimes when people look no. at you know the losses you had but a lot of those were short notice against very very high caliber and were very very hard fought clo- close fights as well uh, flip it on its head uh, i think i'd lose to people i shouldn't have because he went yeah it don't matter he's an yeah. up never heard of him and i oh and i get shocked and then i beat people i shouldn't have beaten definitely yeah, yeah. Um, so, right, so what, what? Dan Hardy, one on one. Um, Paul Daly, Daly. You a couple of times, didn't you? Uh, he, he won the first, I won the second, drew the third, he won the fourth. Um, and our fourth is a cracking switch knee body shot combination. That, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> put me away, but um, but yeah, I needed, I needed some, I needed a face in front of me someone I'd be scared of to bring the best out of me yeah. um, the only thing I was fighting every week was it didn't matter if I lost because in five days I got another one so I can make amends yeah yeah and, and probably back in them days as well you know I think 
I would have loved to have had um, you as a fighter in my gym now as a young bloke. Do you know what I mean? Because I'd have managed to do totally different. Um, oh, yeah. you, you know, you wouldn't have been allowed to take some of the fights you take in at 24 hours notice or um, on the day of the fight in some case, you know, in, in some well, cases. And, and, and probably you'd have been a bit more sensible on your matchups, you know, because today's day and age, particularly, you know, as a Welsh fighter now, there's a real prospect of you signing for the UFC, you know, if, if, if you put that win record together. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, oh. No, well, yes. Right. Uh, my sensible head says, yes, listen to Dad. But um, I wouldn't change what I did because no, I so much win, lose, yeah. I met a lot of people, um, like say 24 hours notice, I took one on something like, oh, Mark Goddard's up, um, I don't know what it was, Aston Villa somewhere, um, football club. I done, it was a day after Welsh International, um, <laughs> I did an 18 hour shift on the door, yeah. he rang me first thing on the Sunday morning, um, said we've had a pull out um, at Light Heavy. Um, the waist not going to be an issue. Uh, the guys only, only had about four or five fights. So I said, yeah, we'll have a look at it. Light heavy, not a problem. We sold something like 104, 105, 106 tickets. So there's a lot of ticket money going down the pan. Um, so yeah, after an 18 hour shift, six hours <laughs> sleep, drove up there, weighed in at 76 kilos in my jeans, fighting a guy from Poland who was about mid 90s. And uh, got a draw out of it. Yeah, um, fairly. Was it was that um, the armor show? Was it Mark Oliver's armor show? The A M M A. Yeah, I think I was it. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. Um, another clear. Yeah, drove on my own. I can't. I've got a clue. Did my corner. Uh, <laughs> got some sandwiches on the way home and went up to bed. Job done. Job done. And, and you know, the money wasn't great, there, but you were probably fighting that often. It was a couple of quid pocket money for you as well when you're fighting week in week out. Um, were, were you looked after by promoters? Oh, I'll touch on that topic, probably get a bit deeper later, but yeah, yes and no. No, yeah. not really, because they go, Paul will do it, and I go, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll do it for yeah. you, because uh, uh, I said I will touch on it a lot better later, but I was earning all right from the doors. Yeah. But, um, but I did have a turn off one year off where my manager saying, you're taking too much, like I said, 17 fights in a year. That's yes. um, all on weekends, so I'm taking weekends off. They're going, if you want to match what they're paying me to fight, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll stay in work. Not yeah, a problem, yeah. and he couldn't argue there. But, um, so yeah, well, he made a couple of quid. I, I was, I was going to bring up a story a bit later on, but we, you know, we're talking about matches now. I remember, um, I run my first ever MMA event, you know, and I've been doing a circuit as a competitor and I just started my own team. and I was going to some of these events and I thought they were sh shocking how we run. So I thought like, I'd do a better job. So I put on um, Samurai Fight Night. And I remember a, a Wednesday before the show, I had a pullout on Marshman and I put a post up on on, uh, on social media saying, Does anybody know anybody you'll fight? I think Marshman was 3-0 and at the time. I remember you ringing me and going, um, you still looking for an opponent for Marshman? I go, yeah, who have you got? And you go, yeah, I'll come up and do it. And, I, and at the time, you know, I was very naive. I, I, I didn't understand what people were getting paid on. And I go, Paul, the purse is only 250 quid. And your words to me were, I'll come and do it for nothing, man. I'll help you out. It's your first show. And I don't think you remember yeah. that conversation, but it's really bad. I, well, I, I, think I, I, I took the fight. I was in work when I took the fight. And I said, if you can't find anybody else by Friday or Saturday, yeah. I'll do it. So I'll do I didn't it. even confirm yeah. it. I said, yeah. keep asking, keep asking. If you're yeah. stuck, stuck, I'll jump in. Um, yeah. But on the night I fought Marchman, um, I went to work in my gear and I said to the guys, cover me, I'm going to be gone about two or three hours. <laughs> uh, went up, got filled in by Marchman, um, put my uniform back on and I went back to work. Back to work. Went back, went back to work. And I mean... I'm and I almost felt guilty, you know, we only, it was only a small, you know, 350 seat show, and I felt guilty only giving you 250 quid. I thought, this bloke's a, gen a genuine, like, I couldn't believe him, mate, you know, and, and to be honest, I think you, you like, nobody knew who you were in the Valleys in, but I think you won yeah. the entire crowd, because it was a good competitive fight. Um, the first round in particular was back and forth, you know, um, obviously Jack was was naturally bigger than you being, being a middleweight yeah. out, you know. Um, and one of the one of the funny stories I remember is uh, you you landed in I don't know if you remember this you were on your back and Marshman was in your guard 
And I was I was saying to Marshman, control control his wrist and bring the elbow and elbow him. And you turn in round and look and you're going, fuck's sake, shake, shut up, will you? You know what I mean? And I just thought to have the the the, the mindset to turn around and have a bit of banter with me in the corner as Marshman, who was a young angry savage at the time, is dropping yeah. elbows on to you. As you know, credits do you you you're the epitome of what a a, a true fighter is, you know. There's a lot of fighters in the game today that I I, I don't give any respect. But it's somebody that I looked up to as a young bloke coming through. You know, I remember when I first started, you, you were legendary, you know, on the circuit. For for those in the know, you know, you mentioned Paul Jenkins and, you know, you, you had legendary status in my mind even back then, you know. So, brilliant, brilliant times. And I think it's times that we'll never see again with the new safe MMA no, and everything else. But, um, you know... Mm. Ready you. you just turned up and I remember I remember seven o'clock and I thought he's not here yet. I was ringing you and you saying, Yeah, I'm on my way up from work now. <laughs> get the doctor ready, I'll have the medical, get the fight over, and I'm gonna yeah. be on my way. But uh and I yeah. and I think even then, you know, Marsh was a bit starstruck. He was like, Oh, I can't believe you got me Paul Jenkins, you know, is like fighting one of his one of his idols at the time. So you know, good good times and you know, good story. But in a sight that story, I was coaching up in St. Athens at the time. Um a lot of para guys, obviously, with a nice tie in there with management. Um, one of the guys who set me up down there had never been to MMA show. Said, "Tell you what, then um, come up and do my corner. Uh, hey, you're getting for nothing, and you've, you've seen your first MMA show. And um, the guy I'm fighting is another Cherry Berry as well. So um, maybe you know him. Uh, I have the different regiments, so they didn't. Um, Marshman turned me inside out." Uh, job down two rounds out. Uh, I thought it was the end of it. And then a week later, I come a guy, Gaz Gale. He's in Australia now. Um, he was still uh, in the Paris in St. Athens then. I went to pick him up and his son, who was about five. Um, and his son ran up to me, up to the car and said, My dad said he got fucked up last week. And he said, It's about seven. <laughs> And, and this guy's this guy's girl's going, no, he never, no, he never. He goes, yes, you did, Dad. You said he got battered. And he went, tell the truth, I did get battered. Do you know they're to skirt around it for the fact that these little oh, kids don't lie, do they? So no, he just went and said, my dad said you got fucked up. And he went, yeah, it happens. Yeah. Take it in your stride as normal. Um, another question on Facebook uh, was was off Harry Selby, you know, Harry, yeah? And... Um, he, he wrote about, could you tell everybody, just for those that are not aware of this story, about the time when you walked past um, Heap of Vito Belfort, but someone else also messaged me and said it was Vandalay Silva when you were naked on, on Cage Rage, when he was doing a backstage interview. I think it was Belfort. It was Belfort, I thought. I think, but, uh, yeah, I think it was Cage Rage London in Wembley. In Wembley it was. It was the Wembley Arena, because they were doing some good stadium shows back then, weren't they? Yeah. Well, um... Yeah, I saw him starting doing the interviews. I said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to fuck it up for him. So, yeah, got all my kit off, walked past, give it a sly wave on the way through, and uh, just left it at that. But uh, I'd imagine uh, his face so, was a beauty, was it? Did he, ha- did he have anything uh, to say? No, nothing in particular. But, um, <laughs> um, I'm not sure that was. What would you bet? Um, it was definitely Cage Rage, and it was at the Wembley Wembley Arena because they had um, they had quite a few big stars come over at the time. They had Shogun uh, cornering um, Ninja. Remember Ninja fought? Yeah. I think was it Alex Reed possibly? Yeah. Um, yeah. Van- Vandalay Silver was over there with his pride belt cornering at one time as well. You know, D- David Donald. And the guys, they they brought some big names over, didn't they? At one point, there was quite a few ex pride and UFC vets. I was sharing a corner. No, I was sharing a dressing room with Gary Turner. Uh, who was fighting Tank Abbott, I think. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah, he did. He um, and he kicked me out. He kicked me out of the changing rooms. <laughs> uh, who did? Gary Turner. Turner. Cause, yeah, because that was a fight. I, I wore the Mankini in. And I didn't I, give a fuck. They, they, uh, they like, Jenkins. Where's Jenkins? He's on in 10 minutes. I'll be in the corner having a sleep. <laughs> and um, I was shadow boxing this Mankini. And he's a very <laughs> cerebral fighter. He's trained... He's awesome. I like Gary Turner. He's a bit dry at times. Very uh, serious, he said, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, he said, Paul, I, I, I can't get in my zone. You, it's fucking with my head. Get out. And he, he did kick me out. I had to, I had to warm up in changing rooms because, uh, yeah. Well, I was fighting Paul Daly for the fourth time for <laughs> my title. Um, and uh, Yeah. Not important. It don't matter. 
Brilliant. I was out of there. I, I, I'd like to, like to have your take on like the, the changes, you know. What's, what's the main differences you see at MMA events today compared to back in the day? Do you know what I mean? And, you know, obviously there's a lot more safety procedures and everything, but, you know, what, what's your thoughts on the, on, on the current state of, of the MMA events, not just in Wales, UK wide, you know, at the moment compared to when you were competing on a regular basis? Unless you're hitting some of the grassroots shows, you've got a much more knowledgeable audience. Obviously, you've still got the bellends going, stand them up, stand them yeah, up, yeah. stop cuddling. Um, but um, that is what it is. Brilliant. Actually, yeah, it's more not knowledgeable crowd who will see something and applaud it, and it might only yeah. a minor detail, and they, some, they'll pick it up. Um, there's that. There's the money. There's the fast track to the big leagues as well. Ten fights in your world class. Yeah. Um, there's the big split now because it used to be amateur, semi-pro, yeah, pro, yeah, yeah. Some, some rule sets. And now you've got your, your amateur, uh, which is the all semi-pro rules, I suppose, for the eight-ounce gloves. You can have 40, well, you should have well, 20, 30-odd fights. Um, do your apprenticeship. And then as and when you're ready, because my first fight was a pro, there wasn't any eight-ounce gloves. It was straight into the fours. Straight in, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you get you get an apprenticeship nowadays. Uh, I, I, I think that's a good term, apprenticeship. I think the youngsters today, uh, they're not aware of how fortunate they are either to have, um, like right from grassroots up there, like your Cage Warriors and, and, and your Bammers where you've got opportunities, you've said, and the IMAFs to, to go away, yeah. fight loads of armour to fight, get the experience in. Um, and also then, as you said, it's a fast track. Like if you, you get a couple of fights in on the smaller shows in, you know, your, your Cage Warriors Academy and then onto the big events, you're also, you, 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 your exposure is phenomenal now as well, you know. Um, uh, and that feeds into your, to your earning power, you know. Um, I use our Jack, for example, the second pro fight was a televised event on Cage Warriors and the exposure that they, they you know, the ability they had to market him and, and, and really build his profile has led to where he is today. Um, and I don't think there was any of that around back then, you know. Shows weren't weren't trying to create um, a path into the USC. They were doing it for personal and, and, and selfish yeah. reasons only, I think. Um, what, what's your take on the... Because I have lots of arguments with people. I'm an advocate of the safe MMA process. For, you know, um, we got a mutual friend, Dave Adicott, that... Via yeah. the safe MMA process, they found that he he had an issue with his brain, and it was that serious that you know the words of the doctor when we went down, they were, if you were to head a football, it could end your life. Now, for me, as disappointing for Dave as that is that he's lost that place on the show and he can't have a fight again, I'll take that every day than than him dropping dead in the middle of a fight. And I mean, oh, what, what's your thoughts on the safe MMA process? He's a husband and father. Yes, yeah, um, spot on. Spot on. You don't want to throw that away for anything. No. Um, honestly, whoever I'm in, whoever my partner is when I'm in my 60s or 70s, uh, I'm going to apologise to them now because I get knocked out on the yeah. Saturday, go home, laugh it off, and do it again the week after, and the week after, and the week yeah. after. And now I'm walking on the house, I'm forgetting the name of my kids, which is great because I haven't got any. All right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going. What's his name? What's his name? And I haven't got. It's, I, I'm forgetting names left, right, and centre. Uh, I got to write everything down. I live on my phone because yeah. I've got. I've got. Oh, is it, is it CTE? Um, yeah. yeah. Steady yeah, at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've got every each and every. I got CTE bingo. I've got every um every number there. Everything every box ticked. Oh, it's my temp. I've never had a temper. My temper has gone through the roof. My memory shot. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you 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 applaud it. You think it's a good thing for the oh, events. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, um, going back to what you said about getting knocked out on a Friday, then fighting the following week. It was the same for us as well in training. I think, like I can remember lo lots of occasions, me and training partners, where you'd catch a clean shot, you'd be out on your feet for a few seconds, and then it'd be like, right, you're okay now, back in. You know, is today. You know, because of, because of the science behind it and because I'm a lot more, um, as a coach, I'm a lot more advanced with my knowledge of what's right and what's wrong. Now I'll pull somebody out and stop them sparring. Just, you know, if they pick up a clean shot in training, I'll stop them sparring for a couple of weeks as well, you know. So I, I'm, I'm a great advocate of it. I'd rather 
you know, people people say to me, oh, you know, but it costs you, you know, 550 quid. Yeah, it costs you 550 quid to start off the safe MMA, but then it's like 140 quid a year to, to, to you know, update your bloods and your medical. So your, your brain scans will last you three years in the UFC, they last five years. But for me, you know, I look at it, you know, if you're a professional sportsman, it's a startup cost. It's 550 quid for peace of mind for you and your family. Yeah, right. so, you know, I I, 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 th- I just wish all shows would follow suit now and would, ju- would jump on that as well, to be honest. On that front, if you enjoy football, you can go out, you can, you can play football, you can go out and you can play rugby. You're going to do this. You, you can't play fighting. No, you're so, right. You're right. Um, yeah. You can't play, you can't mess around with it. It's a different, it's a different animal. Is it a is, you know the sport? What what's the nature of MMA as a sport? I say to everybody, if we we break it down, you go into an octagon or a ring, and and, and as you and another person in this, the sole objective of that person is to render you unconscious by kicking you in the head yeah. or punching your head, choke you unconscious by shutting off the blood supply to your brain, or yeah. manipulate a joint to the point that you're gonna have a fractured arm or leg. You know, so. It's not the most pleasant sport when you break it down like that, is it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, we, we, we no. still have love for it. So there's something not right there, I think, Paul, you know. Uh, what, um, let's have a look, some of the other questions I've had. Right, another one, yeah. Somebody, what, what's your thoughts on how lucky young fighters are today with the facilities? Like, you, you train at the Hangar, which is a really fantastic facility. We just opened up Shore MMA. I know Chris Reese has got a great academy. Lou Long, Kelly Pry, all, the, all these places have got state-of-the-art facilities now um you know what, what what changes have you seen since when you start you know what was what was the environment like in which you was training for an mma fight compared to what the guys have got now as much as you've got 20 200 pound bags you've got a cage set up you've got mats on the floor you've got mats on the walls uh, as much as you have got everyone has got amazing facilities that i never trained with you've also got the coaches yeah, agree. To complement that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, as much as you, you have all the best equipment in the in in, in the world set up in the gym, you've got you haven't got a captain driving the ship. Spot um, on. It's like having a Ferrari and no driving license. It doesn't yeah. work. You've got to have the mate. And I agree no, with no. that. That's one thing that I say to everybody. We were we were twenty years ago competing and trying to learn off VHS videos. It was no internet. Yeah. There was no black belt instructors for us to have first hand. There were no elite level Thai guys or, and there were no, one thing I say, there was no experienced MMA guys to come and show us the way because no. we were the first ones doing it. So, yeah, so you, I agree with the facilities, but more importantly, the coaching is there now for the youngsters today. Yeah, definitely. Um, your James classic example, um, somebody's less, oh, here we are. Flip that on its head, go back 20 years, it's a, Introduce him from Cardiff, Wales, a stand-up fighter, a kickboxer from Cardiff. That doesn't happen anymore. You're yeah, just yeah, you're an MMA fighter. Like yeah. you're gonna do anything, uh, versus uh, a judo player from Kent. So, yeah, you, you get introduced as your yeah. background. Yeah, um, yeah. No, you just whoever you are now. Yeah, you, you, you're who you are, where you're from, uh, and people will automatically assume you can grapple, wrestle, and strike now. You know, it's not, yeah, as you yeah. said... Uh, Back in the days when it's because your gym, you've got a, a striking coach, a yeah. wrestling coach, um, jiu jitsu with yourself. Um, we got Carl Parker up with you still. We we got we've got a, a crew. He moves the Muay Thai coach, who's um, from, you know he's a Thai, Thai guy that's had 130 pro fights. We got yeah. Parker that's doing our MMA and wrestling. We got me that's doing the jiu jitsu and the wrestling. Um, we got a strength and conditioning coach there working at the gym full time now as well. Not, all these things factor into creating a, a really good level athlete now, isn't it? You know, and these are things that we never had. I mean, even when I started um, my, my own gym, it was me taking the grappling class, the wrestling class, and the striking class. And yeah. then, yeah. you know, when I was having this conversation, was the, yeah, go on. Where was that? That first gym? It was down some. I came down to once down some stellar. Uh, it was in a, it was in a cellar. Yeah, it was underneath the nightclub, the arena nightclub, and that is knocked down now. But it was an eight by four meter cellar, and I remember you yes. messaged me, and again, you know, a little bit starstruck back, and you say, "Fuck, boy, Paul Jenkins is coming to, to train with us," and they were, "Oh yeah, shut up, shake, I don't believe it." And then you've rocked in through the door, and it's made everybody's day. But you know, that's what we were training in: twenty mil mats yeah. on the floor, um, eight meters by four meters. You know, and that's that was what I created my first fight team in. You know, so to, to, it's just moved on so much in the last. I think probably the last 10 years have seen a massive change in, in Wales in particular with regard to facilities, 
coaches, you know, look how many black belt jiu-jitsu guys there are, look how many MMA coaches now they've got a, a strong background like yourself or like myself that have been there, uh, have competed around the circuit back in the day. But I do believe as well, a bit, bit like yourself where you, you cross-train with Ewers and all the other different ones, it, it's important that you have specialist coaches as well, I feel, particularly at the higher level 100%. in the UFC and, and the cage way. So, you know, I... I, I I don't like a blowing trouble, but I think at our, at our gym now, we've got a coaching team that I, I stand side by side in the UFC and I have no 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 worries of comparing us with, with the Americans or anything now at the moment. Well, your fighting records prove that already. So, yeah, 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 100%. Yeah, so. Um, on the Welsh scene at the moment, now we got uh, Lou Long's in Bellator. We've got... He uh, does my boxing, Lou Long. <laughs> Lou, <laughs> he does... <laughs> He's a it, he needs he reminds me of me so much because he does things his way only his way forever, um, which I I like. Um, but he needs a father figure, a coach, um, someone to pull his uh, chain in. Yeah, um, he, he's a talent. You know, Lou, Lou for me is one of the best well-rounded fighters in the UK. You know. Um, He's, he's on Bellator, you know. Uh, I would have loved to have seen him have a crack at the UFC. Um, but again, like you said, he's, he's you know, but he's, he's, he's had success with it, Lou, you know, so you can't knock it. But, you know, I see what you're saying. You think no, you should have that, you have that coaching figure above him that's, that's guiding him a little bit more, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's hard. He's, he's coaching him. I know he's worked with Rob Taylor, isn't he? Um, some of the guys, Jim B from um, Eagles. Um, so he's got a coaching team around him, but he books them in as and when. Yeah. Um, he's a little bit self-destructive, uh, which like, I like. He's a bit of a character, Lou, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 one of my favourite uh, Welsh fighters by far. One of my favourite Welsh people by far. Uh, I find it very frustrating because his record doesn't reflect his ability at all. Well, what I was going to say I was just like the, the the top end guys at the moment. Obviously, you've got Lua Bellator, you've got Brett, Jack Shaw, Jack Marshman, Phillips at UFC. Um, we got some really good guys coming through the system now on on Cage Warriors. You know, Mason Jones is, is another Welsh world champion. Um, there's a lot of good prospects coming through the scene. Um, if who, who's your favourite Welsh fighter at the moment, and, what, and what's your reasons for that? Um. It doesn't have to be somebody in the top tier. It might be an up and comer that you, you know, you're a big fan of. I don't have one. No, honestly. Is there no, anyone I like, we, I like you know, I look forward to. I enjoy watching that person fight. No, not because I, I'm gonna get shit for this now because you're the oh, oh. famous Welsh gym, famous Welsh fighter, famous. Um, I like. Fights, fighters, yeah. fighting. Yeah. Uh, I don't care who they are, where they're from, who their dad is. Uh, honestly, they, they become their own entities as and when they jump into the cage. So uh, I like good fights, whoever they're for, whoever they're, they are and wherever they're from. So you're um, not one of these guys that's got like, you know, for example, in the UFC, I love, even though people think, find it, I love watching Khabib fight. I find it mesmerizing just to see how he controls people um i enjoy watching uh corner fight just to see how it's gonna go down do you know what i mean but those are two fighters that i have an interest in not necessarily that somebody i look up to or that, that i that i'm idolizing or think i look up to this just just enjoy watching them fight you know um definitely true um i'm on par with you there um both of them i um for completely different reasons probably the same reasons that you enjoy yeah, you like Connor with the build up, you like yeah. Connor with the attitude, uh, Khabib, results, results, results. Because you know what he's going to do, you know how, what, when he's going to do it, and how you he's going to do it. You plan for it, but you're not going to stop it. Don't, I, I, could have, I could have a plan, like the whole page going, he's going <laughs> to do this, this is how you stop it. And it doesn't matter. He's going to do it anyway. Yeah. Uh, I, I like yeah. how he carries himself as well. Like when, when we talk about true fighting, fighting men, I. I you know, he's been doing it. People say, oh, you know, he's 20, 28, 29 and always a pro athlete. But yeah. I can guarantee you he's probably had over 100 
which is as good as Pro Rules combat sample boats as well. And as you yeah, said, yeah. Uh, th this is a difference, I think, particularly with Eastern Europeans. They're coming into the pro market, you know, you're fighting a debut Eastern European that's got anything between 30 to 100 amateur fights or combat sambo fights behind them. And I think the UK as well is a little bit of an onus where everybody wants to be famous and be in the UFC as quickly as possible. And I think, they, as you said earlier on in the podcast, they need to do a, an apprenticeship, you know. Um, but one, one thing I pride myself on was, particularly with our Jack, is that we turned, we knocked the UFC back three times. We didn't jump in because I, I wanted, when we got there, that we were going to be competitive when we got there. Wanted to stay. Yeah, you know, at, at 3-0, and they offered us um, short notice on the, it was on the same card as Brett and Marshman made their debut, um, Belfast. And they offered us a fight at featherweight because it'd been a pullout. I think it was like two weeks. And, you know, if you'd said to me 15 years ago, the UFC are going to offer you a fight, shit, and you'd be in a position to turn it down. I'd have laughed in your face and said, no, nah, there's no way. Yeah. But, you know, it's about, and again, it's about having faith in what, you, what you're doing as a team, I think, now as well, isn't it? And I think that's the difference today is that with, we're far more advanced than what we were 15 years ago. And we can be a little bit more selective with the choices we make with regards to fighters as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, you know, with the amateurs, I, I say, well, my lads, start off no headshots, nothing wrong with that, just to get a feel. This might not be the sport for you. And then progress with your amateur. Um, and don't rush to go pro. I don't know why people want to rush to go to pro. You know, today's day and age, you've got so many opportunities with the big events around us and the televised events, you know, on Cage Warriors and different things. It makes no sense to me as to why they they want to jump straight in and, and ruin what could be a career path if they were just oh, held, back a, held yeah. back a little bit more. Obviously, now you spend a lot of your time, you know, you've gone from being one of the most prolific fighters to you're probably one of the most you know, well-known coaches. Now you, you're you running Dogs of War, head coach down there, yeah? Yeah. Question I always like to ask a coach, who is the best fighter you've ever coached? And the reasons why? Not necessarily ability, is it? Is it attitude? Is it is commitment to training? Ah, there's an odd one there. Right. I do want to... A lot of my fighters, I say, I shared a lot of my fighters with Craig Ewers Academy, obviously. Um... Right. If you put Keaton, Keaton Bennett... Um... For a couple of your shows, yeah, I got a lot of time for Kieran. Real and another lad for my mind who's a real fighter, somebody that doesn't shirk a challenge, turns up and is a, is it yeah. always it can go either way. He's always in a competitive boat. Yeah, he always had a put on a show and be, uh, be rip people's heads off. So I got, but he doesn't learn particularly well. He's an awful guy to coach. He just is what he is. I get him fit. Yeah. Um, he's stagnating. He's he's stuck at a certain point. Put his head in Josh Hudson's body. You'd have a monster. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, that's a good way. I got certain guys with an amazing skill set, and I got other guys with an amazing work ethic. Um, that's the balance: is getting that guy who's got both. You're looking for, you know, for me for now, you find there's somebody who's got a very, very good skill set, a very, very good approach to training. Because I say to everybody, I've had some absolutely off the wall athletes come through my door that should be in the UFC, but they're not there because mentally. They don't stay in on the weekends. They don't um, yes. turn up to the gym after they've done a 10-hour shift because they're feeling tired. You know, so you want somebody with a good skill set, a very, very strong mental approach. But I say this to everybody, they've got to have a mean edge to them, Paul, as well. You know, they've got to be clinical when it comes to, to finishing somebody at the same time, you know. Um, and some of the most clinical, um, nasty finishers at my gym are not necessarily that way outside of the outside of the gym either as well. It's, it's strange, you know. They, they, they've got a real got, when it comes to a fight. Because uh, not many with me actually, but I know a lot of gyms have gym fighters who their work ethic superb. Um, they can they rip everybody apart in the gym on their given day. Then they put it into a cage at an event and just fall apart and it's, they can't do it under the lights. And, and I don't think that's a unique thing. I think that's at every gym, you know. I've had conversations with lots of coaches. Yeah. And I don't want to name names, but I've had lads at my gym where they've gone, this this could be the one. This is going to be a, the one for me that's, that's going to be a next big deal. But then they just can't do it on the day, whether it's a pressure of fighting in front of their friends and family. I, I, I really don't know. But great attitude in the gym, killers in the gym, you know. Yeah. If, 
if they were able to take that ability into the in the gym into the in, in, into the actual fight, we'd have several world champions on our hands. But they just can't do it, unfortunately. And I think that's a mental block more than anything. Would you agree? No, one hundred percent. There was a guy, Richard Stockgate, used to train with us in Penarth. He would turn me inside out every single lesson. Uh, yeah. There was no range where on the floor he'd stuff me, stand up clinch he'd stuff me, boxing kickboxing he'd stuff me. Uh, good tie record. He's got a win from a low kick thigh. Um, he broke somebody's thigh with a low kick. He was a beast. Um, he started almost at the same time as me in MMA, fed in from different clubs, he turned me inside out week in, week out. He has lost to nearly everybody I beat because it was such a small talent pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and everybody fought each other for like six weeks running and like rotating. Um, right, you're going for Richard, you're going for Paul. Um, we almost, he's fought about four or five people that I beat that he lost to. And in the, in, in the, in the gym, he'd kill me week in, week out. It's mad, isn't it? It's mad, and I, and I, I see that even now. You know, we we've got a, a a big number of guys training with us, and I've got guys that train there four or five days a week. You know, they're regular, they they're at, but they've got no interest in in fighting because it's you know some of them not even in grappling matches. You know, anything is just not for them. No. You know, and I'm not knocking that, but as you said, is there's so many guys there that are what I call wasted talents. Where I think, oh, you know, they should be making an absolute killing financially if they if they just have played this out a little bit better you know if they don't need it they don't want it it's not for them so no and, and it's, it's 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 you know it, as we said earlier it's a tough old sport to say that's what i'm going to make a living at you know because it's a fine one percent that actually make any money out from it you know it's de decent money um and there's a lot of risk you know you you're you one fight away from getting an injury that's going to stop you fighting again you know so yeah definitely it is what it is as you say Right, I'm going to ask everybody that I interview over the next couple of weeks a matchmaker uh, question. If you could matchmake one fight, who would the two fighters be and the reasons why? And they don't have to be famous. It can be local lads. It could be somebody, you know, UFC guys. It could be a past against a present fighter. I'm still a sucker for the early fighters yeah. um, with a limited skill set. Which is probably high for the time, um, but Marco Huas was my cup of tea when he was uh, around. Yeah. Um, say with Igor Von Chenchin, yeah. um, two killers, two absolute yeah. hard, they'd, savage they'd, men. They'd, they'd get off. A, they'd, they'd fight for a fiver. Uh, yeah. They want about the money. Um, but for anybody who's watching that. this video, just want to jump in there, Paul, for anyone who's watching, Google those guys and have a look at some of their old fights, um, uh, yeah. real pioneers of the sport. So, um, they don't age particularly well because they're going, oh, well, I've watched Engine for a 32-man tournament um, and won it, um, open weight. Nowadays, yeah. he, probably, he probably wouldn't even get signed. Um, yeah. Skill level being what it was. But for us, when that blew up on the scene, they were they were gods. So yeah, yeah. that's a good that's a good matchup. That is that's one I would love to see as well. Uh, the, the, uh, another thing about um, just how you see yourself. A couple of weeks ago, I watched uh, a podcast or an interview with um, with Brett Johns on. You know, and Brett is is arguably the leading Welsh fighter at the moment. Yeah, you yeah. could argue with his record and his success in the SE. And in the interview, he said that he actually met you a few months ago for the first time. And in his words, he was a little bit starstruck because he'd heard all these legendary stories and um, coaches and, and older fighters at the gym had always spoke to him about you. And he said when he actually met you, he, he did feel like he was meeting a, a, an icon then, for want of a better. How, how does that make you feel? Somebody like Brett would say that. It makes me feel like a fucking fraud. <laughs> um, it's that simple. Um, I did, the first time we met him was at one of the Budos in Swansea and he did stop me and said you don't know me but and I was going yeah I fucking do know you um, um, I said thanks and I go for what <laughs> I've never even held the door open for you and he said oh I've I prepared by you didn't. and it's uh, if I want to get sucked off I'll come home for it <laughs> um, it's, uh, 
Um, what, what, what I will say with Brett is that if he's saying that, he is a humble and, it, it, and that would be a genuine conversation, you know. Um, and when you look at where he is in his career at the moment, um, it just tickled me. And I thought there's a lot of people will probably, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but they will pass you in an event and not really under, you know, understand or know who you are with the history of the sport in Wales. But... For somebody who was at the top of his game, to just show that bit of recognition, I thought it was, an, uh, you know, for me, and I think it was genuine with Brett's concern. I just think it's a nice touch. No, it definitely was. Yeah. We've, we've shared a, um, oh, a changing room twice. Some of my fighters, he fought. Uh, yeah. He did grappling, I uh, think. We shared, and top fella, through and through. But I'm just not used to... I don't take myself seriously an ounce. You're not used so, to people being nice to you, is a problem. No, I'm not at all. I don't, uh, I don't deserve it, basically. But uh, oh, oh, uh, on, on that note, then, have you ever been at an event where you've been a bit starstruck? Is it no. anybody's come in? Not? Uh, no gods, no masters, no heroes, nothing. No. Uh, no. Um, no. I'm a, I was at Wolf Slayer training and I'm. Um, who was up there? Oh, Rampage Jackson was up there. Yeah, uh, yeah. We were all sharing a mat. I sat on his hoodie. I was sweaty as shit. Um, <laughs> he came over going, sat on my hoodie. And I'm going, don't wash it. That sweat's going to be worth something. Um, <laughs> and I go, no. And I go, oh, sorry, Rampage. Sorry, Rampage. Oh, I don't want to get it dry clean for you. No, fuck you. Um, <laughs> uh, I, no. Uh, again, some of these people... Who asked, oh, I want to be like so and so, I want to be like so and so. Uh, world renowned fighters. That's not, that's not how I judge them. Because yeah. um, I know they might be assholes in real life. Yeah, I agree. So I, I agree. Uh, I, 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 and that, that's happened to me a few times where you've met somebody famous and this they, they're not what you was expecting it to be, you know. And um, you're quite let down, I suppose, because sometimes you see this persona on TV or online and, and when you meet the person as you said they, they can be quite an asshole so yeah. you know I, I've i never been one of these to go uh, two people have asked for a photograph one was um, uh, Shogun because uh, we was in Brazil and I gotta be honest he was sat on the table next to me I thought I can't I can't pass this opportunity up he's, he's somebody that I, that I wanted a photo with um, and one that you know you you'll know who this guy is but most people want is Ray C4 Ray C4 was uh yeah. Waiting for a lift at one yeah, of the yeah yeah waiting for um a, 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 to get in the same lift and I've gone like oh, there's nobody about I can't but may they say any chance before because he's somebody again there are not a lot of people know him but I remember him as a young bloke when I was fighting he was he was the real deal when he? he was one of those guys that was a real stand up tear up guy as well yeah uh, oh. I've met I uh, know I've never had no no I, I, I'm not surprised at that answer off you that's that's yeah I, I'll be honest I was. I was half expecting that that as a response from you, but uh, I've been asked to ask the question, so I'll put that across. Question that I want to ask you is: Do you miss trolling the Cage Warriors forum? Uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't trolling as such. It was, no, no, listen, uh, it was listen, listen, listen. It was trolling as such because I remember asking, um, "Can someone recommend a place to get a cheap pair of gloves?" And you sent a link through on it. Now, when I clicked on it. There's all sorts of pornography coming through on my work computer and noises coming out from it. <laughs> I was flapping and hitting buttons and the screen wouldn't go off and the volume wouldn't go off. And I just thought, yeah, I've been Jenkins there. He's nailed me big time. Yeah. <laughs> Is that my fault, though, or your fault for clicking on it? <laughs> you should know better. Uh, so, <laughs> so shout to yourself. Uh, uh, was, if you clicked on one of my links, more fool you, because... Uh, um, <laughs> Hey, yeah. one, it was one and done, Jenks. Let me tell you. Yeah. A, I, I, I seen it come up then over the over the years. And you, you, somebody will go, like, you know, anybody know any way to train near Bath? And you go, yeah, click this link. <laughs> I think I know what's on here. I'll get, I'll get, oh. It was bad. It was almost, it was an accident. Uh, Craig Ewers, before we, we only recently started training together, so we're mid to late 2000s. He sent out a group email somewhere. Um, I thought I was doing a sarcastic reply to him, and I put a picture in the email that was rank. It was one of my one of my better works. It was <laughs> horrid. 
Um, and for, not somehow, some way, because I didn't know what I was doing at the time. Everybody he sent it to, over 30 odd people, um, got my reply. He went to everybody. <laughs> and one of them was a university uh, lecturer uh, in Bath University. And um, I think he's going to report me to the police. It was <laughs> that harsh. But um, I, uh, more for Craig's sake than mine, um, um, I have to send a couple of apology emails. She's unlike me because <laughs> no apologies ever. But uh, oh, they're going to cost him a could have cost him a coaching job. So that's be nice. Cool. Um, well, long left. So a couple of couple of things to wrap up on. Um, who's who's the next Welsh fight that you think is going to get in the UFC? Mason probably. Yeah. And he deserves it. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, was he nine and zero now? Isn't he world champion? The I just think Mason's just won the title, and I think circumstances is going to be out of his out of his hands. Is the fact that this this coronavirus has meant there's no shows, and yeah. I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen it online, but Boylan did an interview with um, Pete Carroll uh, on Eurobash yesterday, and he made a really good point about. At any given time in the USC, there's 30% of fighters are injured or on suspensions because they're coming off a fight. Whereas we're going to go now probably four, five, six months before there's another UFC event. By that time, the entire roster is going to be fit and ready to, yeah. to fight. So, you know, I don't think there's going to be an opportunity for um, the doors to be open for anybody to, to, to sign at the moment because you, you tend to find like, you know, Guys are getting signed at the moment because there's a shortage of an opponent for somebody on a on a big event, and and that door is open. But unfortunately, you now I just think we're going to have a, a full roster. And I hadn't really thought about that until I watched the interview yesterday. But I think that's a key one. But I, again, Mason's what 24. I don't think he's in. A row. I'd like to see him, def, you know, defend the title. Um, yeah, I'll definitely. Yeah. Maybe in one or two, you know, he, he, he's doing well. He's a big name now in in Cage Warriors. He's having great exposure. The more wins he gets. The, the more bargaining he got for a better contract when he actually does sign. Um, but yeah, I think Mason will drop into that lightweight division now and, you know, he, he, he'll do well. He'll do well. Anybody else, any up and comers you think down the line are, are destined to get in there? No, because I miss half them. Because if I'm at a show, I'm spending half my day stuck in the uh, changing rooms. Yeah, um, so myself, yeah. So I don't get to see an awful lot of scraps anymore. Yeah, it's, um, um, people often say to me, "What did you think of the event?" I go, well, "I'll have to watch it back tomorrow because even yeah. when I'm running a cage warriors event, you know, Colin runs a floor as soon as four o'clock comes and the first fight starts. I've usually got three or four amateurs and four or five pros, you know, so you tend to be constantly backstage prepping everything, you know. So your head's in a different place. You're you're working. You're not a spectator, so um, you're not going to catch a show. Um. I'm trying to think if there's any other questions anybody's asked. I think we're on top. When the, was a common theme, you know, but to be honest, I think you're going to probably have multiple answers. Somebody said, what's the craziest thing you've ever done at an MMA event? Now, whether that's being as a fight that was a coach, I mean, uh, I'm once, not sure. I won. That was crazy. I won at a winner. Actually, actually, you won 40, where's the, where's the log to? 40... 41 times on record, and it's probably a bit more than that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, so where, where do you think yeah. you're going to fit? Who have you spoken to about getting these last two fights? Are you allowed to say? Um, there was uh, Budo, I fancy in Swansea because uh, I am going to travel. Uh, almost got one, I can't remember where that fell to, um, uh, in Western Supermare. Yeah, um, it was stand and strike. Um, that's um, Stu Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you know what's going on there? We got I got four guys penciled in for May. I can't see that happening. Yeah, they're gonna happen, mate. Yeah. And, uh, we I had know a, it says. my guys won't be ready, so no. Yeah, well, well, we we had a we had a conference call with the, uh, some of the key players on the, the run the Cage Warriors events last week, and um, me and Boylan both said exactly the same thing. But, you know, you've got to give fighters at least eight weeks now to prep because they'll do an all, yeah. they can still do their cardio and things. But, you know, it's no good. The gym's opening up on, I don't know, say the 1st of July and then expect them to fight within three or four weeks. You know, they're going to yeah, need no, to, to, to get. And also, I think you're, you're letting the crowd down with that as well. You're not you're not giving them a spectacle of fighters that are fully fit and, and ready to go, you know. So I think it's going to be probably eight weeks 
after the gym's open that we'll see our first show, is what I'm guessing. Yeah, definitely. Right, one last one for you. If you could, if there was one fighter that you would love to take under your wing as a coach, who would that be? No one, because as a coach, I'm doing too much. I'm covering everything. I wouldn't do. I wouldn't do a promising fighter that disservice. Yeah, because um, you're just too busy at the no, moment. Yeah, to commit. Yeah, uh, I'd say uh, I haven't got the coaching staff to cover everything. Um, the time. Um, I'm. You no, know, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't do a fighter that disservice by saying yeah. right, you're mine now. Uh, I'd rather point them in. If they were local. Swansea, send them over up to you. I'd send it loads of places, but um, that's something that I've now been great at. Um, being greedy, never have been. Um, good, I've never gone, Oh, come train with me. You're going, Oh, so and so is 10 miles down your road. Why did you go there instead? Not <laughs> um, so too honest, Brilliant. my own good, yeah. Right, we'll finish off then. The books, you know, you're not somebody who comes across as um somebody who keeps a head in a book all the time, but looking behind you, I think that's probably not the actual case, is it? So, you 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 a big reader? Massive reader, massive steady, quite, right, uh, I kick my own butt for this week in, week out. I'm my own worst enemy in terms of my public persona, because everything's funny, everything's rude, nothing's ever serious. Um, because of that, nobody takes me serious. Um... I have got quite a good academic background. Um, I got novels. I got well, and well over a thousand books. I got yes. one. Like I said, I said to you earlier, I got, I've got nine boxes of books and um, and pack. I got nowhere to put them. That's not including my. They were down the gym for a while. Oh, I got a fighter's notebook from years ago. I've got my, um, uh, I got books on every facet of MMA. Um, I it's enjoy good. reading. It's my, yeah. it's my downtime. I, I think everybody, you know, I, I read a lot. Now, I listen to audio books a fair bit now because I'm in the car a lot. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. people need to blow their minds and, and try and get that through to some of the youngsters I work with in, in the school and in the gym, you know. Open your minds and, and, and learn something that's not necessarily the norm for you, you know. It's, o, o, you know, open up your horizons a little bit. Oh, definitely. And, and also as a coach, be honest about it. Um, if I see something in a magazine or on YouTube, I'll go to the gym the next day and say, I saw something amazing yesterday. I'm not sure if it works. We'll have a play with it. I didn't yeah. invent it. This guy did. And don't try and pass it off as my own work, um, <laughs> which a lot of other coaches do. Um, um to be honest with you about your source. So um, I'll take stuff I've seen on YouTube yesterday, coach it in the gym tomorrow. Um, yeah, that works. Nope, doesn't work. You need six hands to pull it off. Um, yeah. And that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Everything's trying to basic Yeah. Everything's trying to isn't it? Everyone wants to know, like, you know, some of these submissions will go, oh, can we do this? And I get that. On the first watch, I'll go, you need six pairs of hands to pull that off. Under pressure, while they're getting lamped in the chops, that's yeah. not happening. Um, I'm, my my guys get a little bit bored because I'm massive. I'm big on on um, raw basics. Um, yeah. The week in, week out, they might have been training five years. We'll still do hold down drills. I said, yeah, yeah. from there. Um, we we, I done a I done an interview, funny enough, this week uh, a podcast, and they asked me, and I, I, I tried to explain to them. The, the perfect example of me is Roger Gracie. He is somebody who's an elite level, world class jiu-jitsu practitioner. He's fought in the UFC. He's arguably one of the greatest jiu-jitsu fighters of all time. Yet you watch how he wins fights. It's all, as you've said, with rock solid fundamentals and basics. You know, yeah, take down, that. mount, cross collar choke, off your back, basic armbar. But it's basic fundamentals done with real good finesse. And I, I, I'm a great believer, as you said, there's lots of stuff which... I'll teach in a jiu-jitsu class in, in a, in when I'm teaching BJJ, but I will say, but this is no good for you in MMA because you're going to get your yeah. teeth knocked down your throat. You know, it's a bad position. Yeah, right. Well, Paul, thank you very much for, for you know, taking the time to chat with us. I think there's going to be a lot of guys that, you know, want to really know who you are is going to have a, a better background as to a little bit about you. 
Do you want to just say to people where, uh, a little bit about your gym and, you know, where they can find you on social media? No, it's thanks for the uh, invite of you, uh, first of all. So, yeah, cheers for the invite. Um, if you're Cardiff or Cardiff area based, um, Dogs of War is running out of the hangar, HPC, which is on Panath Road. Um, as and when we're back open, same with everybody else. Yeah. Um, but we just, we were in a second week actually of a beginner's course, which we run like six week beginner courses, as and when the gym opens back up again. Um, that's going to, probably going to restart it, discount the first two weeks. So we got a beginner's course come up, so anybody fancies it, Cardiff area, um, Hangar HPC. Uh, we got our own website. Get in contact. Is it is it contact details on the website? Yeah, there's, there's links. I'll probably go through to Faith that well. Faith that well, the owner. Right on. Um, um, what what I'll do as well at the end of the the, the film, and I'll I'll put a little slide up with um, the details of the website for you as well, mate. Yeah, sweet. Oh, yeah. All right, right, ladies and gentlemen, our first guest then, as and let us down, Paul Hands of Hands of Stone Jenkins. Cheers, Paul, and we'll see you soon, mate. Catch you soon. Ta-ra.